I'm not saying that we gloss over it or pretend like sin didn't happen or mistakes didn't happen. I'm just saying that we need to recognize there's a better time and place to handle those questions than when the person is drowning. When the person is drowning, you help them first, you start evaluating how they can avoid that situation in the future a little bit later once they've recovered some. Hey fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today does come from the book of Matthew. So I know that you're going to uh, probably be raising a math, uh, raising an eyebrow when you found out that this passage is coming from Matthew, especially considering this is the abortion special, but it actually does tie back in. So just follow me on here. Uh, follow me with this. I know that it doesn't directly pertain to abortion, but I think you're going to like the message that comes out of it. So let's go ahead and look at Matthew 14 verses 22 through 33, which states immediately afterward, he talking about Jesus compelled the disciples to get into the boat and to go ahead of him to the other side. Well, he sent the crowds away. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter responded and said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened. And when he began to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out with his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are truly the Son of God. Now what does all that have to do with abortion? Well, a few things. First of all, I want you to focus on a phrase that occurs in that story where the disciples are freaking out because they're seeing a guy walking on the water in the middle of a storm, which I'm sure was a sight to behold. I've always wondered, like, did Jesus sort of like stay where he was on the water or like when a wave came, did his, did he follow with the wave? I just out of curiosity. I'm a, I'm a guy. I think about weird things like that. But anyway, so that's where Jesus is outside the boat, walking on the water. And he says, do not be afraid. You know where else that passage occurs? It's the first thing that the angel says to Mary when he tells her that she's going to have a baby. Do not be afraid. You see, God didn't want Mary to be afraid. And in the same way, he didn't want Peter to be afraid. So the same announcement that was made at the before the birth of Jesus is also made at this point. And that's one of the core messages of the gospel. Jesus is saying, I'm here. There's no reason for you to be afraid if I'm here. And now we know that he's with us always, even into the ends of the earth. And so we don't need to be afraid. I think that it's very important that when we encounter women that are in situations that might compel them to seek out an abortion, that they're freaking out, their family's freaking out, that the first thing that we do is say to them, don't be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. Reassure them, comfort them. Let them know that they're going to be taken care of and that everything's going to be all right. And if the moment is right and they are somebody that believes, remind them. You don't have to be afraid because Jesus is here. 
Everything's going to be all right. Yes, there's a storm. Yes, it's bad. Yes, there are things about it that are going to be difficult. But you don't have to be afraid. I want you to know something else, too. Peter, who was undoubtedly the bravest of the twelve, at least in this moment, maybe he wasn't at other times, but he certainly was here. He trusts Jesus, and he trusts him enough to ask him to come out on the water so that he could come to him. And he does. And he hops out of the boat. But after he does that, he looks around, he sees the storm, he sees everything at life that's coming at him, and he starts freaking out. And he falls and is now swimming like a regular person. He took his eyes off Jesus, and that caused him to not be able to handle the storm. And now he's, now he's stuck. Now he's got a problem coming on. And right after that, what he does is he says, Lord, save me. So if you are a pregnant person or somebody that is connected to a pregnant person, maybe you're the father of the, the daughter, maybe you're the father of the baby, you know, the, the girl's boyfriend or husband, whatever it may be, if you're connected to this in any way, maybe mistakes were made. Maybe like Peter, somebody took their eye off Jesus and it caused a catastrophe. It caused a problem. It caught, The storm is now coming for you. And now the storm is your problem because as long as you kept your eyes on Jesus, it wasn't bothering you. But now that you didn't, now there's going to be some earthly consequences to that decision. That might describe you. But what should your immediate reaction be? It should be the same as Peter's. Lord, save me. There was no delay. There was no, maybe I'm a strong enough swimmer. And Peter was a fisherman. Believe me, the guy knew how to swim. <laughs> but evidently this was too much for him and he realized that. So his immediate reaction was, Lord, save me. He didn't rely on himself. He didn't think that he had to go it alone. And he didn't cry out to the other disciples because he realized the person in the room, figuratively speaking, of course, the person in the room, the person that is nearest him, that can lend him a hand and that would be best suited to do that is not the guys in the boat. It's Jesus. And so he was wise to call upon the Lord to save him. And what else do you notice about what happened there? Immediately, the word immediately is actually in the verse. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and helped him. There was no, uh, Peter, maybe you ought to swim there for a second. Think about what you did. Maybe you need to take a few mouthfuls of salt water and, and see how that feels. You shouldn't have taken your eyes off me. There was none of that. Kind of like I said earlier in the program. There's a lot of Christians that I, I think on some level might mean well, but when they point out that mistakes were made or that, you know, these people that are engaged in these pregnancies, they shouldn't be having sex out of marriage. Okay, that's true. But if you're already pregnant, that advice doesn't help much. I mean, do, is, it, is it true? Yes. Is it good advice? Generally speaking, yes. Does a woman that is freaked out about becoming a mother need to hear that? No. Because, first of all, she probably knows that at that point. I would hope so. But second, whether she does or not, that's not helpful at that moment. Might be helpful at another time, but it's certainly not helpful there. What that person needs is someone to reach out a hand and help them up. That's what is needed at that moment. Did, did Jesus say, go back in the past and make it to where you... No. It, Jesus used a lot of things as teaching moments. But you'll notice that whenever he's confronted with somebody that needs help immediately, that is, is in crisis and needs him there, what does he do? He helps. Is that still a teaching moment? Sure. But if we are Christians, if we are supposed to be Jesus's representatives here on earth, then what we need to do is reach out a hand and help them and offer that olive branch to them. There will be time for sorting out where the mistakes were made later. And that does need to happen at some point. I'm not saying that you gloss over that. But in that moment, that's not what the person needs. You reach out, you grab them, you help them get back on their feet, you help them get back in the boat. The storm, you know, will subside at some point in their situation. It was immediately. 
And then maybe it's time to start having a conversation about some of those mistakes that were made and how we can improve. But you also notice what happens directly after that. When they get back in the boat, having seen all of that, they worship him and say, he is the son of God. See, after seeing that, they got who he was. Did Jesus in that moment take a, a, a moment to, while they're in the storm, tell them that he was the son of God? No. I mean, he's told them that before. But his actions showed who he was. And when we do this to somebody that is hurting, that needs our help, those people will praise God as a result of that too. Maybe not every time, and maybe not immediately, but that is the inevitable conclusion at some point. And so, I think we need to be a little bit more forgiving and a little more Christ-like and have a little more mercy rather than sacrifice when it comes to some of these issues. I'm not saying you ignore it. I'm not saying that we gloss over it or pretend like sin didn't happen or mistakes didn't happen. I'm just saying that we need to recognize there's a better time and place to handle those questions than when the person is drowning. When the person is drowning, you help them first, you start evaluating how they can avoid that situation in the future a little bit later once they've recovered some. And so as Christians, I just really want us to be aware of that. You know, Jesus was never afraid to call out sin. We have no indication he was very bold in, in every time that he called out somebody's sin. But do you notice that that was usually not the first salvo? That there were things that preceded that? Like, when he's talking to Peter here, he just kind of lets the lesson teach itself. He doesn't tell Peter he screwed up. I mean, he does mention that he has little faith and that he wants him to improve, but he doesn't go into a long lesson on all of that right then. And he even only does that after he's already helped him. Immediately, he reaches his hand out to help him and then starts giving him a lecture on that. And it wasn't even that long, to be honest. But on top of that, if we look at, for example, the woman of the well, he had a conversation with her first. He talked about her situation first. Then he called out her sin. The woman that's caught in adultery. Now, I know that there's some debate about whether this story actually belongs in the scripture or not. I tend to think that it was probably tradition that was added later, so it doesn't belong in the gospel, but it probably is a real story about Jesus. In that story, you remember what happens is it's very Jesus-esque. He saves the woman first and then tells her to stop sinning. And so that's very much in keeping whether it's a true story or not. It's very much in keeping with Jesus' characteristics and personality. And that's part of the reason that I think it actually probably is true, even though it doesn't belong in the scripture. We could look at countless other stories where Jesus heals, helps, saves, first, and then starts talking about where we can do some improvement. And, and when I say save, I mean save from physical danger like he did Peter here. The salvation does have to come after repentance and confession and so on. But in all of that, in the midst of everything that was happening there, Jesus only called out sin first when it was people that already knew better, the Pharisees, the lawyers, that kind of thing. When it was people that needed help, help was always the first thing that he did. And if we want to be followers of Christ, we have to adopt that same attitude. Stay the course, friends. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow son of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel, you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.